Pokemon has always been more than just the physical games, merchandise, and materials. Since the beginning, there has always been a community and social level to it that has its own unique power and say over the perception and feel of the series at large. The games, and then resultantly the communities we play them with, can make you feel like certain things just have to be true, and this reading between the lines occurs to create additional lore and stories that just grow and grow to the point of sometimes having lasting relevance as famous rumors or myths about the games. Probably the most common variety of this phenomenon are those playground rumors type stories. Famous myths like Mew being under the Vermilion City truck or that you could fly into space at the Moss Deep Space Center and encounter either Jirachi or Deoxys. These rumors have their own power, they stay in people's minds. Sometimes elements of them even get referenced in the games themselves at a much later period. Those two specifically may have informed game design on remakes of the games that they take place in. You could find a new hidden item in Fire Red and Leaf Green if you can get to the platform with the truck, an Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire fully have you fly into space to fight and catch Deoxys. Now, I am fully fascinated by this type of thing. And one of these that's been really interesting to me lately is a phenomenon with certain Pokemon being widely misremembered as being in the wrong generation of games. And I'm not talking about straightforward easter eggs like Togepi being in the first series of the anime or Munchlax showing up in a bunch of games before Diamond and Pearl officially came out. Those are still important, but the Pokemon that I want to discuss today are misremembered from their original gens because of explicit game design and structure choices. That's the aspect I want to focus on. A series of odd mechanical coincidences that got a large number of people to believe something Thing. Like that Slugmo was actually from Gen 3 instead of Gen 2, just to give an example. So let's dig into exactly why and how the games themselves sometimes encouraged you to misremember where certain Pokemon came from. Let's start with that example of Slugma, because I think it's a really good example and it's a very common one. Slugma was introduced in Gen 2, but is essentially a Gen 3 Pokemon in every other way, so it's pretty commonly remembered as such. The Gen 2 games were extremely noteworthy when they came out for including two regions, the all-new Johto, but also the Gen 1 Kanto region. And a new region obviously means new Pokemon, but in this case a handful of new Pokemon were only made available in Kanto, which this time around could only be explored after you beat the game. And so Slugma is kind of a shock as a choice here. It can only be caught on three routes in Gen 2 Kanto, routes 16, 17, 18, and it's relatively rare on two of those. Other than that, Slugma's evolution Mag Cargo is featured on the team of the Fire Type Gym Leader Blaine, but he's also a post-game character. This exclusivity in its debut game is even weirder as Slugma is statistically the worst fire Pokemon, and one of the worst Pokemon overall by the numbers. So obscuring it feels like a very strange choice, even more so because it was just released. But then in the Gen 3 games, it's an early game encounter on the story mandatory Fiery Path, and is then heavily featured at the Fire Type Gym where it has a slot on the Gym Leader's team. These games force you to look at Slugma's absolute brilliance with only a few badges into the story, so with that comparison, it's very easy to see where the confusion stems. By all accounts, Slugma is a Hoenn Pokemon, way more than it is from Johto, and it's honestly really weird for me to call it a Gen 2 Pokemon at all without some sort of disclaimer, because in my books that usually means it's from that debut region, but I guess you get some early weirdness here because of how they linked Kanto and Johto. Now you would assume that a Pokemon with these qualities is really odd and unlikely. But Slugma shares this weird Gen 2 but not really from Johto status with a few other Pokemon, Murkrow and Houndour. Looking first at Murkrow, it originates from the Gen 2 games, but is very easy to identify as a Pokemon from Gen 4. Murkrow can only be obtained on two routes in Kanto in Gen 2, so it's pretty rare in its debut generation. So if you miss Gen 2, or just kind of glossed over them, it'd be very easy to think that Murkrow is from Gen 4, where it was featured prominently and early on in Diamond and Pearl. It's an encounter very early in Eterna Forest, and it's featured prominently on Cyrus' team. And with him being the main bad guy and all, it would make sense if someone assumed that this was Murkrow's original game. And it is Haunchcrow's original game, Murkrow's Evolution, so it's got a pesky combination of a very low-key release in Gen 2, and then a new evolution in a future installment. You know, let's go ahead and just throw in a surprise entry here with Ms. Drevis, because it is almost identical to Murkrow in all these ways, but was somehow even less prominent. Not a single NPC fights with Ms. Drevis in Gen 2. That's really weird, because the ghost gym's right over there. And then even further, it is only found in the wild in Mount Silver Cave, which is the absolute last endgame area that requires all 16 badges to get inside. But I guess it is technically still the Johto region. So it feels weird to call it a Gen 2 Pokemon at all when it's 
virtually non-existent in those games, and then it receives a lot of focus in Diamond, Pearl, and Platinum. New Evolution, obtainable early, featured on a gym leader's team. Extremely strange the way that they originally debuted it in hindsight. Alright, so that brings us to Houndour. Once again, a Gen 2 Pokemon only found in its launch games on a route in Kanto. Gonna try to avoid repeating myself on all that. But Houndour is very logistically unique as a Pokemon, because it's very rarely available in the base story of any game, let alone these early ones. Across Gen 2 and 3, the only time you can get one normally before being the main story of a game is a single Shadow Houndour in XD on the GameCube. Beyond those games, it is almost always a version exclusive in the games it appears in, across all of Pokemon. And even though it came out in Gen 2, the first time Houndour was just a regular old tall grass middle of the story encounter was in Platinum, and Houndour and its evolution Houndoom aren't extremely powerful or have some creepypasta type secret to them, they're just relatively plain fire types that seem to have been historically obscured. It's very odd. And I say all this to demonstrate it's very easy to not see Houndour as a Gen 2 Pokemon, but it doesn't really have an identity with any generation in particular. Its perception might be the most interesting to me of any Pokemon in this grouping, because you might hear a number of different memories and stories of Houndour based on the different experiences people have had with the games. I thought it was a Gen 3 Pokemon. That's because XD was one of the first games I was able to play after I borrowed it from a friend. I decided to use Houndour on my team. But there's a number of different ways that that could have gone. All the details about Houndour are weird, but in a way, I like it, because it gives Houndour a piece of personality that exists in reality rather than Pokemon. Since it doesn't have as much of a concrete origin as most Pokemon do, it might have a different story depending on who you ask. And that's a really cool to have with a character. Moving on to another Gen 2 Mon, we have the Steel Flying Skarmory. Very easy to remember as a Gen 3 Pokemon. Skarmory can be found normally in the main story of Gen 2, actually in the region this time, but it's kind of a victim of good game and map design. In these games, after beating the 8th and final gym, Professor Elm will call you and tell you to come back home so he can give you the Master Ball, and then you can go work on doing the end of the game stuff. The 8th gym is up here in Blackthorn City, and Professor Elm is down here in New Bark Town. Now you could walk and ultimately see Skarmory in its natural habitat, but I just got out of a big gym battle. Claire was a nightmare to deal with, so I could just use Fly to get back home quick and see what the guy calling me on the phone wants. So you never have to take the route if you don't want to. It connects up the region and makes it more of a grid and then has some new Pokemon on it. Definitely a good thing that it exists for the people who want to keep exploring, but you don't have to, so it could be really easy to miss Skarmory. In Gen 3, Skarmory is rare, but is found on a route you must pass through early in the game, and it's featured on a decent number of trainers' teams, including the flying gym leader, so it's very possible for it to have felt new when you saw it in Gen 3. Okay, so let's move forward a bit now and do some that are from Gen 3, but don't really feel like they are. My personal insert here, and it's one I've talked about before, has got to be the Ice-type Snow Run. In Ruby, Sapphire, and Emerald, Snow Run can only be found in the ice area of Shoal Cave. And this is a unique place, because your access to the dungeon is based on what time of day it is, and Snow Run's area is only available half of the time. And the in-game clock battery controlling this could die, leaving the Snow Run stuck down there. I was unable to put two and two together that Snow Run evolved into Glalie for a very long time, and I still don't really get this evolution. It's pretty fun though, so I'll let them have it. On top of this, Snow Run got a new evolution and relative ease of access in Gen 4 with the all new Frostlass. So if your battery ever died with the cave lock, Gen 4 could have been the first time you actually saw Snow Run. This is a really cool one. Because of an in-game arbitrary setting getting combined with an arbitrary amount of playtime on a battery's lifespan, there was a character in the game that was entirely obscured. Such an odd combination of details that resulted in a different experience from everyone else. And I mean, who knows? Maybe if I saw it when I was 8, Snow Run could have been one of my favorite Pokemon instead of one that makes me slightly mad at a gameplay mechanic. But it's still a really cool testament to this sort of contrivance. And that is perfect for this last one that I've got for now. It's my favorite installment of these. The Gen 3 Pokemon Metatite isn't extremely uncommon or rare with some condition for spawning. You can get it pretty easily at Mount Pyre and then on Victory Road. The reason I like this one so much is because the subject of this story, or the person who's experiencing it, seems to be the games themselves in a weird way. Meditite is pretty easy to get a hold of in the Gen 3 games, but they practically grow on trees in the Gen 4 games. They are extremely common. They are exposing you to Meditite constantly, so you could definitely consider it a Gen 4 staple. Jump forward a little bit to Heart Gold and Soul Silver, where these games have a radio in them that features some stations that can influence overworld encounters. Two of these are Hoenn Sound and Sinnoh Sound, which play the first route music 
music of the respective regions. That music can then be used to encounter Pokemon from the region the music comes from, and a Pokemon that can be spawned in this way is Metatite. But not with the Hoenn sound, the music from its home region, Sinnoh sound, spawns in Metatite. And this is a deep detail, it's very in the weeds type stuff. But are the games saying here that Metatite is more from Sinnoh than it is from its home generation region? On paper it's obviously from Gen 3, but getting spawned in with Sinnoh sound and not Hoenn sound doesn't really communicate that, especially as someone less initiated. But I really like this detail because it demonstrates to me a sort of awareness that the gen number for any Pokemon starts to matter less and less as time goes on. A Pokemon's origin and home point is way more of a personal thing for any given person. Their origins are ours to create as players. These are the stories and details that give Pokemon that level of real world lore. It isn't something that exists anywhere in the canon, but enough people remembered or experienced something a certain way that it results in a shared memory or an idea of something that is still very real. It's one of the things I love most about these games. We as the players have shared ideas, stories, and memories that influence the perception of what the canon actually is. And with this specific example, a Pokemon's origin, the general player base experience might just be as important as when a Pokemon technically first came out. It's something that informs the legend of these characters going forwards. Now, I say all that, but there are definitely some Pokemon that have an identity directly related to the generation they came out in. There's about 151 of them, to be exact. I do want to make sure I point out, before we close here, that not a single one of the Pokemon that I went over were from Gen 1. And that's because on the other side of these Pokemon without a really strong home identity, there's a set of them that have an incredibly strong identity. That's just being from the first generation of games. There's even a new TCG set coming out right now called Pokemon 151 featuring just those Pokemon. That branding identity is especially strong with the first generation. Even though it's just random things sometimes, like a bunch of eggs, or sludge, or a literal rock, these Pokemon have a very real, strong, and financial identity attached to being the first generation. So it goes both ways. Pokemon get a lot of meaning assigned to them, not just from the games and the canon, but also from the real world, the company and the game's players. It's one of the things that makes Pokemon so enjoyable not just to play by yourself, but to experience and talk about with other people. We get to make our own stories, and these misremembered Pokemon are just another example of that. It's pretty cool stuff. That's all I got for you today, folks. Hope you enjoyed this one. Did you have any Pokemon like these? Were there any Pokemon you think I missed? Let me know down below. I'll see you next time. Jeremy Shout.